Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavins Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavins. Our guest today is Nicole Garotti. Nicole, are you ready to be great today? Yes, always. Nicole is a marketing manager at Telview, author of the most inclusive HR influencer list, and host of the hashtag HR for all Twitter chat. She is passionate about improving HR and teleacquisition through diversifying voices of influence within the profession of technology. She's appeared on or been featured as an HR and a marketing expert on ERE, drive through HR, Workology, the Sherm blog, and more. Find her on Twitter at, at socialmccoll or at www.socialmccoll.com. McCall, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So for people who don't know, what is a Twitter chat? <laughs> yeah, so a Twitter chat is a space for us all to get together and chat about a specific topic. Um, normally, we come together on a theme, um, and the theme is normally set in advance, and then we all use a hashtag at a specific uh, uh, time and talk about a, a specific topic. Now, HR professionals, it seems like Twitter is like their social media platform of choice, it seems like, right? I think so. I feel like there's different um, cliques within the HR influencer community and some really like thrive on LinkedIn. Um, I prefer Twitter personally. And I think that um, when the, the influencers who are on LinkedIn come on Twitter, it's like a whole new world for them, which is kind of funny. Um, but it's happened quite a few times. And um, I like Twitter, but that's just me. So how did it come? I mean, you might not, you might not know. This, how, did it, how did it become Twitter? Like, I mean, people on, they're on LinkedIn is strong, but like, why not Instagram, Facebook or some other like, you know, random social media, like it's always been Twitter pretty strong, right? Why, why Twitter? Um, I like the fast pacedness and I like that it's a little bit more conversational and not as much, I don't know. I feel like with LinkedIn, I feel like somebody posts something and then people comment, but I don't feel it's as conversational and I like the more relaxed conversational um, pace that, that Twitter is. Now, how often do you do your Twitter chat? So it's a monthly chat. It's the second Tuesday of every month. Um, so we last month we talked about uh, with Janine, we talked about creating um, employee resource groups for um, people of color at work. And actually the one coming up is with uh, Fair Harris and we're talking about workplace wellness and that, that will, uh, the questions will come out for that next week. And so like, um, and so I guess so the how the Twitter chat works, I'm I'm guessing like you have a like a, a expert on there, you ask a few and people get the um the questions in advance, correct? Yeah, yeah. So um I announce the questions in advance. Um my co-host is the uh is Corey Kapner from Recruitix. And the two of us jump on at the one PM Eastern Standard Time, the second Tuesday of every month, and we pose the questions and then everybody can chime in and answer them. And we have a, a special guest who is um kind of like the expert on that topic and can give answers and kind of collaborate with people and and help them kind of introduce a new perspective into what we normally think about that topic. I'm guessing this has to be a great way for people to connect with each other. Could you probably get on there and connect with people you've never heard of before, right? And just follow them and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So actually that's how I met a lot of my friends today is we started out being on the same Twitter chats and then you're like, Oh, I like the way that you think on that. And then you can like talk one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and it's still a really fun place to be. And um, so, yeah, there it's, it, it's, it's a good time. So Twitter, whether they deserve or not, is, has a reputation sometimes of being like a, a gutter place, right? Like there's trashes on there sometimes. <laughs> how do you control that on your Twitter chat? Do you just block people or, or, or how does that work? Um, you know, blocking's one way, muting's another. Um, you can mute words, you can choose, your, your Twitter is kind of what you make of it. So if you, you um, don't follow certain topics or things, sometimes you can get away with it. Um, I definitely can see that the gutter perspective um, and it, it can be that sometimes, but I think that there's also some good that happens on there. And those are the, the, the moments that I like to dwell on. Yeah. So, so you're, you're a, bit of, a pretty big fan of Twitter then, right? <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm their number one fan, but I, I, I enjoy it. Well, well I, I enjoyed it the way it is now. Yeah. <laughs> so if they made you the CEO of Twitter for a week, what were oh, some, no. what, what were some changes you would do? What do you think they need to do to make it better? Oh, that's a big responsibility. Um, I feel like this is going to get a little bit political, so I don't know if we want to stop now or go there, but I mean, I would definitely make it 
um, I would do a little bit better job at a lot better job at like policing what's said. Um, I just don't, I think that people do have a right to say what they want, but I don't think that they have a right to subject other people to it. Um, and so I think that if people are going to be mean, then, you know, don't come here. And if people are going to be nice and productive and have awesome conversations and, and join in Twitter chats and be great, then that's the place that um, I want to be. And that's definitely the Twitter experience that I enjoy. And I think that that would you know, be a much better experience for others as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely a fine line, you know. Yeah, definitely. So I could be wrong, but I think I've seen recently where Twitter's going to do this thing where you like, you can decide who's going to make comments on your Twitter and stuff like that. What's your opinion on that? Um, you know what? I, I did see that too. I don't know if I formed an opinion yet. I kind of like that you can, it, again, it's, it's another way to kind of create your own experience on Twitter. I'm not sure that I... I don't think I've formed my opinion on it. I think there are certainly pros and cons I haven't weighed out yet. Yeah, I definitely think it's pros and cons, you know. When we get to me thing too, like, you know, a lot of people talk about free speech on these platforms, but I mean, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but, you know, free speech applies to the government, right? And these are private platforms, right? So how much does free yeah. speech really apply? That's, that's something that weighs heavily on me. And that's, that's actually my opinion too. I, um, I think that like they are private companies. They have, a, it's like if you go to a movie theater, you can't yell fire every, but that's like the example that everyone uses for like, is free speech really that free? And Twitter and Facebook and all of them, they're private companies just like movie theaters. So, you know. And also too, I mean, it's free, right? You know, you're not paying to be on the platform. I mean, it's free and you get all this benefit from it, which I mean, I don't understand that either, right? So, but you know, that's just me. <laughs> So how does, how does someone find out about your Twitter chat? Like, how do you like publish it? How do you like push it on a social media? How does someone find out like some random person who's just got an HR or marketing, how they find out about your Twitter chat? Yeah. So I publish information about my Twitter chat. I publish uh, Twitter chat previews and recaps on my blog at socialmccall.com. And I also, um, you can find it on Twitter using the hashtag HR for all. And then, um, so your, your, special, your special guests or experts, however you want to call them, how do you pick those or how does that work? Like, cause, cause you do one a month. So that means you only have 12 guests per year, which is like very limited. So I, I just imagine that's like a high profile place to be on. Like, do you have, I'm sure you have like a, a backup list of people you reach out to, or can some random person just say, Hey, I'm a quote unquote HR expert. You put me on how that process work. <laughs> so we, we, we actually don't have a process yet. Um, we The chat's pretty new. We've only had a few of them. I think we started um, maybe the beginning of Q2 of this year. So we've only had a few, but we already have a backlog of guests through March of next year. I can imagine. Um, <laughs> and there is no process yet. Um, it's just uh, most of it's been people asking me, hey, can I be on your chat? And I'm like, great, you know, next year. <laughs> um, but we might need to put in a process and put a process in place because yeah, it's, it's getting a little back. Yeah. It's same about podcasts. Like I have people reaching out and say, I want to be on the podcast. Oh, well, you know, I got a backlog a few months and then they'll get on like, will this be out next week? Oh uh, no, it won't be out next week. You know, like, yeah, it's, it's a challenge sometimes. Yeah. I imagine you, you've been around a lot longer than me in this space and doing your podcast. It's a lot, it's been around a lot longer than my chat. So I imagine that you get that way more than I do, but yeah. Yeah. So next talk about your HR influential list, which is how I found out about you. Talk about that. Yeah. So the list is a, a crowdsource nomination based list. It's completely free. Um, you can nominate, uh, a peer or yourself who's doing great work in HR and, you know, sharing about their amazing experience in HR online. Um, and right now the list features over 180 people uh, across the world. So we have people in, I think, 14 countries or 15 countries across six continents. Um, so it's really global and it's become an amazing place for people to kind of connect with each other and learn about HR and learn about who's doing amazing work in HR and um, really just kind of like support each other. Now, did you say people could nominate themselves or did I hear you wrong? Yeah, you can nominate yourself. I really wanted a space where um, a lot of the lists that come out today are um, everybody on the list looks the same. They're the same 100 people across every single list. 
some of the people haven't worked in HR for a while and or they retired um, and there hasn't really been a space for new people, up and comers, um, to get on those top lists. So I really wanted to make us a, a, a space to help us in HR diversify the voices of influence. And so, oh, what we're gonna say? No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted a space for us to be able to diversify our voices of influence in the in HR, and to for even for vendors um, to connect with new voices and and get some quotes out and get you know get new people, hire new fresh faces and voices. Um, so that was kind of the intent behind it. But I feel like a lot of us are afraid to nominate ourselves, especially if they're new. And I really wanted to kind of cut that out and just say, look, if you're doing great work, if you're on social media, nominate yourself. Let's like let's get the community working together. Yeah, because I mean, you know, it's like you have all, all these like conferences, words of insurance, other, you know, other conferences. It's like it's the same speaker over and over and over again. And don't be wrong, they're great speakers, but like, come on, like, I, you know, if you said the same thing like 27 years in a row, right? Can we get someone else to say something different, you know? Yeah, and it, it's it's more than that too, though, because I, I completely agree with that. And I think that the audiences do, like, if you've seen the same speaker over and over again, at some point you're going to be like, okay, well, like, a new speaker works too. Um, but I think that it's more than that too. From like a vendor perspective, um, the same top 100 influencers are great. They do amazing things for your brand. They know your customers really, really well. But the same 100 people can't service as many of the thousands of vendors in the space. And the thousands of vendors in the space, you know, need to branch out and kind of look, get familiar with people outside that larger same top 100 list. So in terms of even just like influencer marketing or um, people that can promote your brand and products, branching outside of that same top 100 is really important. Yeah. And you might be, you know, great in HR as a you know corporation, but are you really good at HR like in a small company or you have right. HR, you know, experience in you know, restaurants, but not manufacturing. It's like, you know, I'm a firm, like, one of my pet peeves when, like, just not HR, like, people in general say I'm an expert, right? Like, we'll use HR, so we're talking about HR, like, I'm an HR expert. Are you really, like, you know everything about HR in every single location, every single industry? Maybe you do, but I'm going to bet that you're not, right? Like, even if you're, like, you're the VP of HR, we'll say, in a manufacturing company in Tennessee, you're an expert of that. But you're an expert of HR and, like, how tech does it in Semi Valley? I, I just don't know. Yeah, there, there's... HR is so big. There's so many different aspects of it. There's organizational development, there's planning, there's learning, there's um, recruiting, there's payroll and benefits and comp. Like there's just so many different spaces in, in HR that it can be hard to, um, I don't, it can, it can be hard to like really grasp everything at once. But the whole point is that usually most people don't have to. Yeah, you're right. So Back to the nomination process. I, I'm sure this hasn't happened. Has this ever happened? Someone gets nominated, you put on the list, and someone reaches out to you and says, hey, you know what? This person probably should be on the list because they've done this or this, right? Has that ever happened? And if it did happen, what, 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 do, you, what do you do? Um, so we do have a no jerks policy. Um, to be honest, I, I really need to, um, to crack down on it a little bit more. It's been a lot to manage just by myself and I do, I mean, um, I'm the mark. <laughs> I mean, you have a hundred people on the list. It's gonna, it's gonna hard for you like, to go to each one's social media all the time and, and monitor what they're doing. That's impossible. You can't do that, so. Yeah, so I definitely need to get better at that. Um, it's, it's something that I need to do and it's something that I haven't been able to do yet, but it's something, it's needed for sure. Once someone gets on the list, are they all on there for all time or is there, is there a new process each year? Um, sort of, but no. So th the list is a list of current HR practitioners, analysts, marketers, um, but the, the emphasis is on current. So if somebody retires, they're not on the list anymore. If somebody moves out of HR and gets into a different um, profession um, or it, are no longer HR adjacent, they're not on the list anymore. Um, so you don't necessarily have to apply apply every year. Um, you're, if you're on the list and you're still in HR and you're still on social media, you're going to be on the list again. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're on there forever. So there's no limit. Like if it, it might be 100 this year, 200 next year, it, it can get, get bigger and bigger. There's not a, like a limit on it then. No, um, there's not a limit actually. So the first list, so we launched two lists. The first list was, um, the, it was launched in October of last year and there were 150 something professionals on there. And then the second time we launched, there was 180 professionals on there and we're about to launch a, a new round of nominations and a new list for the end of this year. And I'm sure it'll cross well over 200. 
um, you might not know this, but do you have it broken down by not, but not um, but like uh, by industry, like like no number of VPs, number of directors, like number of HR people in small companies, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I broke it down. It, it, right now, it's alphabetical order as much as I could get it. Um, it. It's alphabetical order. I have I have like stats and metrics listed on my site because I wanted to be. It's it's named the most inclusive HR influencer list. So I really wanted to be transparent about who is on the list, what the makeup of the list is. Um, and so I did the best I could to break it out. Um, and the, all of the stats for that are actually published on my website. Okay. Um, and we actually did something cool that, you know, I worked with uh, Anthony Paradiso from All Things App. Um, he's a diversity and recruiting, uh, sorry, he's a diversity um, ex and inclusion expert. And I worked with him on um, creating a new nomination form to help people um, break it out. So if you're nominating yourself, I ask a lot more questions to get into the, the demographic breakout. And then um, there's a separate form if you're nominating somebody else. So that way we can kind of really dr dive into the stats. And um, that way we, we're not asking anybody to self-identify somebody else. We're just saying, if you're nominating yourself, we would like to know this information. So that way we can um, make sure the list is as inclusive as possible. So let's suppose uh, we'll make a name up. We'll say Tom Jones. Tom Jones gets nominated next month. He gets put some, he gets put some lists. What does Tom Jones get out of being on the list? Yeah, so uh, Tom Jones it will get, um, there's like an awards process. You can say you're an award-winning influencer. Um, and so if you're kind of a new blogger, if you're an up-and-comer and you're on the list, this is a lot of times going to be the first time you can say you're an award-winning blogger. Um, your name's also on a list, so that way when vendors go and do research on um, who to quote or who they want to work with, you'll be more likely to be found, um, which is pretty cool. And we have had a lot of the influencers on the list book speaking gigs, get connected to vendors, um, and you can also join our influencer community on Facebook. We have an HR for All um, influencer Facebook community for the influencers on the list. Um, and it's become a really cool place to uh, I just kind of talk things out, share things about influencer marketing or HR or um, that kind of thing. So it's been, it's been a really neat place and you can also join that community. So Nicole, you talked about this a little bit before, but can you go into more detail why you, why you started this list? Yeah, so I started the list because I noticed that there were, at the time, there were a bunch of lists that all came out at the same time, and they all had the same people on it. And there was a lot of kind of pushback from the um, the newer influencers that are uh, I'm, I'm friendly with and know pretty well on Twitter. Um, and I was thinking, like, why are, the, why, why, like, who made the same list across all of these lists? And people started asking me, like, you know, how are these lists made? And as somebody who, you know, may put together like smaller lists for, for vendors that I had worked for in the past, um, the truth is they're not data driven. It's basically like, who do we want to get in front of for them to share our website out on social media? That's basically what it is. Or who do we want to be able to like know who we are? And that's not really a great <laughs> approach when you're trying to, um, it's just not really a great approach. It's not inclusive. So I was like, you know what? I just need to, I know everybody in the space. I know how I can put up a website really easily. So I did just that. I put up a website. I created a nomination form and um, everybody seemed to really like it. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how the list came to be. So Michael, let's talk about this. In my opinion, there's a lot of HR people who are too focused on just doing HR and not being business people, right? The follow-up, yeah. you know, I think HR people still don't get how important HR, the partnership between HR marketing it is, like how important it is to be a marketer as an HR person. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, I, I have heard the same sentiments that you have, especially, it's weird because especially in like the recruiting space where your job is literally to like sell candidates on like why they should come work for you. Um, and I feel like, um, I feel like, I, I don't know why that is. I but I feel like maybe we should be a little bit more open. And I feel like every person's job is to be a marketer at some point. Like you need to be able to have the skills to talk about yourself, your company, your job, what, you know, your life in a way that is appealing and attractive to other people. So I think that in terms of HR um, and recruiting, we need to be able to get better at saying like, 
this is what we do. This is why we do it. This is the value it brings to other people. And to be honest, I think that that's why HR has such a bad reputation because they don't get in front of, um, they don't get in front of conflict before it happens. So whenever, like, like when I use this on, um, I, I spoke to Matt uh, Burns on this a, a couple weeks ago. Nobody knows what a good HR person is supposed to do, but everybody knows what a bad HR person is because it happens to them at their companies. So it's all about reputation management and going in front and saying like, this is the value that I'm providing you every day. And HR hasn't figured out how to do that in a really meaningful way yet as a whole. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think some of that, to play devil's advocate, some of it is, is the boss they have. Like, you know, some bosses think HR is supposed to do certain things and HR tries to do things differently. The boss, like, you know, puts them back in a place. I know you're going to do this right. And, you know, you all want to say we're going to fall on the sword, but you want people that have mortgages to pay, bills to pay, right? And, like, you, you know, so I, I think there's something to it. Like, another pet peeve of mine, too, like, you, like, you'll see these companies, you know, that gets in trouble for doing something more or whatever the case may be. The CEO did something wrong. Where was HR at? <laughs> I'm pretty sure 99% of the time the, the HR person is saying, CEO, you don't want to do this. And it was ignored, right? But it's always you hear, you know, like any of the big companies, like right? XY company, where's HR at, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. I kind of think it's also, I, I definitely think it's that, but I think a little bit of it too is that like, le like HR is directly tied to legal and compliance. So it's, it's heavily regulated in a lot of companies. And so legal is always super cautious and they, they they prefer like, if there's any question, it's a no. And H so HR doesn't really have the opportunity from that perspective to go out and be promoting themselves. Um, but I think, I do think it's important. Yeah. A lot of it too is like old versus now. I'm not saying old on like age, but you know, a lot of people have this old mindset, you know, like answers always no. this is what we've always done. It, you know, like, you go to like right. an HR person, hey, I have, a, I have a way to like improve this what process. Well, that's going to mean more time I can spend the day I'm not going to do that, right? And I think that's a lot of it too, you know, unfortunately. Yeah, I, th I, I, do, I agree. I think it's very old school. But I think, I think there is a push, though, to be way more progressive about it, especially in like with the whole diversity and inclusion push. That is a, an effort to make uh, organizations way more progressive and inclusive. And I, I think that it's a good thing. So I think that, um, and, and also technology, technology is starting to um, break away from compliance and really into functionality. So I think that between technology and new functions of HR, and even with remote work now, I think that they're going to be there, there's going to be a time where people have to kind of say like, okay, HR can be compliance, but it can also be really strategic and really cool. Yeah, an example I use all the time, like suppose you have a person in your company that by far the best worker, right? Best worker for five years, right? Like it's not even close, right? But you have a policy that says anyone misses work for three days, like just misses the work for three days, they get fired, right? And this guy misses work for three days for no reason. And so the policy says you fire him, right? Old HR always say, well, I'll get rid of him. New HR always say, okay, look, I know what the policy says, but can we just find out why he missed three days, right? Is there, can we like find out what the reason is, right? I think it's a big difference right there. Yeah. Moving, yeah, moving away from policy and into human. I think that's exactly what that is, and I think it's important. And I think this is another thing that HR is doing wrong, and I'm gonna blame marketing for a little bit too, right? So, we're say you're hiring for a job, right? You have a hundred candidates, and this is just generalization. You have a hundred candidates, you're gonna call five for interviews. Nine and five, you probably won't contact, right? If I was Mark, I would say, hey, HR, why are you not following these ninety-five people, right? Can you add them to the email list? Can you add them to some list, right? Can you keep them in touch, right? Because you just at least alienating 95 potential future customers or future something, right? I've never understood like marketing doesn't like, you know, hey, HR, what are you doing here? You're missing a, a potential lead here. Yeah, I think that marketing and HR are way misaligned. And I think with the employer branding efforts now, there is definitely in recruitment marketing efforts. I think they're, they're, coming together in, for the first time in ways that we haven't. Um, but it is interesting because some uh, I've noticed that uh, a lot of those times, the HR department is building out a marketing function within the HR department instead of collaborating with the marketing team. <laughs> so um, I don't know. It, it's possible that they're hiring actual marketers to do that recruitment marketing and employer branding functions, but I'm not really sure that they are. That's crazy. So, Nicole, from your point of view, what are most people getting wrong about marketing? Yeah, so 
in my opinion, there's, there's a lot of different ways that marketing works. Um, and in my opinion, I think that marketing is all about storytelling. So it's getting the right message to the right people at the right time and from the right person. Um, and I think that it's a lot of people think that marketing is a, okay, marketing, it worked, it's good. But marketing is not, it, it worked, it's good. Marketing is a, okay, is a long haul, long game. If you're in business, you need marketing because you need to be able to equip your sales team. You need to be able to talk about your products. You need to be able to handle crises like freak pandemics. You need to be able to go and manage situations like when if your CEO wins the lottery and decides to leave the company, you need to be able to say, do some like, Hey, well, let's, you know, let's figure out what to do. Let's, let's ease the customers. Let's work with sales. Let's work with product. Let's work with, um, the rest of the team. Like you need marketing to be able to tell stories and help people understand what you do and why you do it and why they should come work for you or buy your products. And I think that, um, marketing is a lot of things and not everybody understands exactly what it is. Um, and they don't need to, but the, the foundation is storytelling. So Nicole, we talked a little bit about, about different parts of HR, how expensive HR is. Can you talk some about the different parts of marketing, how expensive marketing is? Yeah. So marketing, so there's digital marketing, which is manages a lot of the ads you see online or websites, company websites. Um, there is uh, there are marketing technologists that build out um, like Salesforce systems or um, you know marketing automation systems. There's people who manage social media accounts and corporate communications, so like press releases, or they go on the radio or they create um, you know t television ads. There's people who um, are really good at generating demand. Uh, so they can go in and take a product and say, okay, great. That's what your product is. I'm going to go and make sure that people are really interested in that. There needs to be people that can say, okay, that's the product. Here's how we need to go to market with that product. And then there's uh, now a newer kind of marketing account based marketing. That's literally like our job is to understand who our buyer is and what they care about and what they need to make that decision and then puts together marketing programs to literally say like, you know, Jason, you know, I know that this is uh, you and this is what you need to buy this product. And here's like, here's me selling you on a platter. Go talk to a sales rep. And there's just so many different kinds of marketing and yeah, it's cool. And marketing is during a long process. Like, like, like you're not going like, to put a website on one day, on Monday and Tuesday, be number one on Google, right? It's a process in it, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, that is, that. it's, it's a process. Again, yeah, it's definitely not a short game. It's a long game. You need to keep it going. Um, and it's, you, you need to constantly talk about your stories because if you're not talking about you, who else is going to? Yes. What are some, like some mistakes you see people make as far as marketing? Yeah. So some of the mistakes that I see people making is, um, being very them centric instead of audience centric. So again, it's back to the stories. Um, it's people don't care about you. People care about themselves. So if you're in marketing and you need, you have a product or whatever, you need to be able to, to break down your story in terms that people can understand and be comfortable in. I also think one other piece of marketing that people don't understand is that the message, especially today, people are very distrusting. So the, the, who the message comes from is almost as important, if not more important than the message itself. So there's a reason why customer reviews and influencer marketing is so prevalent today. And it's because if a CEO says their product is the best, nobody cares because every CEO thinks every, their own product is the best. But if an influencer or a customer says this, you know, X, Y, Z product is the best, then it, it has a lot more credibility. So I think those are the two mistakes that I see a lot. Uh, and they're so easily correctable. What's your opinion on this? I think you'll see some marketers say like, no, be on every social media platform, content, 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 content. Can you know, you never know what a future customer will be. Your, your other people will say, well, no, pick one and focus on that. What's your opinion on that? Or is it like a combination? I think it's a combination for sure. I think that part of social media is understanding where your audience is, like, well, really any channel. So understanding where your audience is and then putting together a strategy that helps 
the customer see that you are a value add um, to their their noise that they experience every day. Um, so I think that one channel may it may be good, it may not be good, um, but I think it's more important to understand like what your audience is and, and where they are and who they are and what they care about. If that makes sense. What are what are some marketers that you personally follow? Oh, so I love um, some of my favorite marketers. I love Mary Ellen Slater. Uh, Slater. Oh my God, I can't believe I just butchered her name. Um, but Mary Ellen is amazing. Marin Hogan, she's amazing. Um, there are so many great uh, marketers in the space. Um, and uh, yeah, we're all really cool. <laughs> we, we all know each other too, which is nice. What, what, what makes a good marketer? Like what characteristics make a good marketer? Yeah, I think just being really moldable and understanding um, what you know and what you don't know and then really saying, okay, so if I don't know this, um, either who am I partnering to gain that skill? Who am I working for to, um, you know, who, who am I going to partner with? How am I going to learn that skill? Um, but I think that the most important thing is really just understanding your audience. Like, and, and just kind of knowing what, you, what you're talking about too. Like I, I had an assignment from uh, uh, my work at Talview to, to write about something and I was really struggling to write it. And normally I can crank out, you know, blog content, whatever it is, landing page content, whatever I need to, I can write things pretty quickly. And I was really struggling and then I realized I, I can't write this because I don't know what I'm talking about. So I was like, all right, well now I need to know, you know, what I'm talking about. So I, I took, I, I reached out to some of the people internally and I was like, all right, help me understand this. Let's, let's get to the bottom of this so I can write. So I think again, no, knowing what you're talking about and then knowing who the audience is are the two most important things. So Nicole, from, from your opinion and your perspective, what makes a great HR person? Yeah, so I think a great HR person understands both people and the business and is able to connect the dots between the people and the business. So, Nicole, tell me if you think this is an oversimplification, but does this seem like most marketers are extroverts, or most HR people are introverts? Oh, I don't know that. I don't know that that's the, tr the, the truth. I think that is an oversimplification because, again, marketing and HR is just so, like, it's so large. Like you don't need your, your payroll specialist to be an, an extra, an extrovert. And I don't even think that I am, to be honest. I like, I think that I'm more of an ambivert where I just, I, I need it to be around people, but then I also need to be around, you know, myself and just chill out. Um, so I, I don't think, I think that that's definitely an oversimplification for sure. Yes. Can you define the, the term future of work? Yeah, so I think that the future of work means a lot of things, but I think that it's especially uh, focused on, um, like, it means hope, just like creating a better situation for tomorrow than you had yesterday. Okay, and uh, we both have a good friend by the name of Kirsten Griggs, and I believe you and Kirsten had a, a webinar, or you all did something recently, and you discussed best team versus best person. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we launched an ebook earlier this week that featured um, 10 top uh, uh, HR recruiting and diversity experts from top companies around the world. And it was around should you hire the best person for the job or should you hire um, to build the best teams? And the, we're having an event next week for Global TA Day on that. And it's, it's basically going to talk about the fact that we have been very um, individualistic and, and person-centric um, in regard to hiring lately. And we've built a bunch of teams. We've hired a bunch of people that don't work together well. And they can't get anything done and they hate each other and it's terrible. And that's why we're burnt out, stressed. and. It's interesting because the, the idea kind of came from a McKinsey study that was said that 82% of Fortune 500 executives don't believe their companies recruit highly talented people. And I don't think that's the case. I think that we just don't feel the talent because we hire people that have the same skills over and over again. And we don't hire people who have skills that the initial people don't have. So we're, our teams are not well-rounded. And so we don't feel the talent because we don't hire um, for, you know, we don't understand what our team, what skills our team has and, and what, what they're missing well. So, Nicole, do you think the fact that it's like people are changing jobs like every two years now, like before people stay in jobs five, six, seven years, 
it's not going to make it harder to build great teams. Like you might hire two people today, two people a month from now, but it's like the rotation is like even harder, like quicker and quicker, right? So I said like it makes it even harder to build a great team when you know within six months people are leaving, right? Yeah, I that's definitely something interesting, and I think that we will look at that. But p- actually, something that uh, Kirsten and I were talking about, and we're we're actually going to speak to this in the webinar, but I'll, I'll brush on it a little bit today is um, people leave because they're not treated well, they're not paid well, and they have no career growth. So uh, voluntary turnover is a solvable situation if we promote people from within and and we show people, we we help guide people through their careers. We pay them a decent living wage to help them get to their financial goals that they want to achieve. And we just generally treat treat them well. People are going to stay. So it's, it's interesting that we talk about like, well, it's so hard to build teams when everybody leaves. It doesn't have to be that way. No, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, everyone wants to just want to be appreciated and like feel like they're actually in, like doing something important. Yeah. So next, you know, everyone talks about, you know, no, no brilliant jerks, you know, it, like even if you have a salesman, you know, bringing a million dollars a year, but he treats everyone like a jerk, you know, get rid of him. Have them play, <laughs> I'll play devil's advocate for a minute. Suppose you have a salesman who's a jerk, bring a million dollars a year, right? It's like he's number one salesman bring a million a year and the other four salesmen combined only bring like 200,000 a year, right? So you get rid of the salesman because he's a jerk. Then you lose all the money and you potentially lose the company, right? Like, so how do you do that, right? Do you, I, I mean. Yeah, I think that's a difficult situation to be in, but I think that there is certainly like an opportunity cost. So that one person may be bringing in all that money, but why are the other people not performing? It it might be because they're not great salespeople, but it might also be because they feel terrible about coming to work every day and they're not able to be their best. And if you get rid of the jerk, maybe they'd perform ever better. Maybe everybody else would be in a situation where they can thrive and kind of do great too. That's a great point. So we talked about recruiting a little bit, so I want to cover that. So in recruiting, it seems like there's thousands of recruiting companies, there's AI, there's webinars, on and on and on, fix the process, all this kind of stuff going on. But it's like it never gets better, right? Like, why, why not? I mean, what's, what's going on out here? Yeah, so I think there's three components to kind of anything. There's the people, the process, and the technology. And I think that our current hiring process is built around the fact that we just don't treat people well. So we have high turnover, so we constantly have to be recruiting. But it wasn't always the case. Um, the So I did a webinar with Claire uh, Petrie a few months ago with the talent board, and we talked about um, how – having really meaningful conversations um, in recruiting can solve a lot of our problems because we'll be able to um, work with hiring teams to say, listen, like we're going to find you good people, but we need to know a little bit more about what you're looking for. And we need to be realistic and we need to sit down and do some research to say like, we're not going to go off of like a random budget that you, you based on, you know, you don't want to pay your people. Well, we're going to say, okay, what is this person worth? What's a livable wage? Um, how can we create a positive situation for um, this person coming in and then working with learning development and training and talent management, performance management teams to really say, okay, this person's coming in as let's just say a recruiter, but they really want to be in recruitment marketing. So, or, you know, we're going to give them a career path that's catered to them and really say, okay, great. You're in this now, but we understand that you don't want to be doing this one job forever. You need to be able to grow and breathe and learn and, and be a person. So we're going to help you get there. And I think that HR and recruiting and managers need to work together to, um, kind of build internal mobility possibilities and say, you know, look at, you know, at a macro level, this is what our organization is doing today. And this is what we want to be doing in 10 years. And then really like, who do we have and what skills do they have? And then these are the skills that we'll need to um, have for the future and then really help guide and coach people to get there. I don't think we're doing a great job at that now. You know, it's like a little joke, not much, you know, like you'll see, you know, as a made up, you know, job description, uh, intern, master's degree, 20 years experience, unpaid, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like, you know, like, Hopefully that's not a true statement from anyone, but you know, you get the idea, right? It's like, are you kidding me right now? Like, yeah, it's ridiculous. I hope that people like see those job descriptions like in public and they're getting made fun of. And then you're like, we should probably stop doing that. 
<laughs> yes. And then like, you know, I think in the hiring process, I think the uh, recruiters get a lot of blame for, you know, whatever candidates get a lot of blame, but I think a group could these more blames the hiring managers, right? Cause they'll be like, they're like, they, they, they recruit like one set of requirements and, oh, I, they change their mind. Or they say like, I want someone just like Bob. Well, we're not hiring Bob Jr. We need to, you know, so how do we like train up the hiring managers or is that even doable? Yeah, I think that that is completely doable. I think that that speaks to the bias in the hiring process. And hopefully we have, we have some amazing diversity and inclusion experts. We have, um, it, companies are, are it, it's a hot area right now. Hopefully, um, those uh, people in those positions are feeling empowered to go in and really point out the, our current flaws. I, there's no other word than flaws and bias. And it's something that we all need to work together to overcome. And if somebody is really resistant, then maybe it's not the place for them. Maybe they need to get out of HR and or recruiting and, and or not be a hiring manager. And maybe we need to focus on the people who are willing to really take a hard look at themselves and their team and say, okay, you know, we have, you know, Sarah, Joe, and Bob, and we, we need somebody like with, you know, Sally's skills that are different than Sarah, Joe, and Bob. And we need to get her on the team because she's going to round out the team more and make us better. So, McCall, with the various options for recruiting, like, you know, those HR companies, outsource HR, HR, and HR, how should a company go about deciding, okay, this is how I want to do recruiting? Should they, like, how do they decide I'm going to hire my own internal recruiters, outsource? How, how do you recommend they do that? Oh, that's so not my area. Um, I don't want to, <laughs> that's one of those things that I would call up Kirsten or um, Sarah Brennan or Matt Charney and say, hey guys, like I have a question. Let's, um, let's rally the troops and get some answers. But I definitely would not feel comfortable doing that on my own today. Okay. So let's talk about something I know you're comfortable with. Let's <laughs> talk about your, your, your website and your social media call. Yes. So how did they get started? What's that all about? Yeah, so my website actually got started. I, I've had a blog for years, but it, I was not really publishing a lot. It would, you know, be just whenever I can get something out. Um, but my website, I, I made the website for the list basically and, and changed from a blog to a website. And so the list really made the <laughs> The website after I, I the list came about because I shared an idea for it on Twitter and was like, is this even of something of interest? And people were like, yes. And the the emphatic yes was just like, okay, great, I have to do it now. Okay, I need a website. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's kind of funny. And can you talk about your your role as a market manager at Telview? Yeah, so Telview's an amazing. Um, uh, recruiting automation, video interviewing, and pre-hire assessment platform that helps companies source, screen, schedule, um, a short list, and assess and interview talent. Um, and what I do there is I um, do a lot of talking, a lot of, <laughs> I talk a lot about um, a bunch of different topics to say, like, listen, like, you need this product because this is the value of it. This is what it will do for you. Um, and then I do a lot of talking about um, how the industry, uh, where the industry is going. So the, um, the webinar on recruiting conversations with Claire, that was done through Talview. Um, the should you hire the best person for the job or build the best teams, that's through Talview. It's all about helping recruiters and organizations be better at recruiting and do recruiting in a way that creates an amazing experience for candidates and that um, helps recruiters be comfortable and able to work efficiently and understand where their um, strengths and weaknesses are and, and make the corrections. So Moko, what advice do you have like marketers now who are like out of a job and trying to get to a new job or in a yeah. situation? Yeah, marketing is really tough right now. Um, not everybody sees the value in marketing as much as I do. Um, if you are looking for a job, I, there, there are companies that are starting to hire right now. Um, and don't be afraid to launch something cool on your own. That's like one of the things that I like to say, like if you have an idea, you don't need to wait for a company to hire you to do it. It's just gonna make you more marketable to do it on your own, but also just connect with people um, and apply for jobs. There, there are companies out there that are hiring right now and network, you know how to do it. If you're in marketing, you should know how to do it anyway and um, get yourself out there.
So can you talk a little bit about the importance of being on social media and just in general as a personal brand for your business? I think too many people are still like quote unquote scared of being on social media. Can you talk about yeah. the importance of putting yourself out there? Yeah, social media can be a scary place, um, but it can also be a really beautiful place. And I think that if you approach it from the perspective of we're going to build, we're on here to build relationships and we're on here to meet new people and do cool things. I think that it makes it a little less scary and you don't have to do it all at once. Um, you can uh, do whatever you're comfortable with. You can, uh, there are, have been a lot of people that, um, for example, with the Twitter chat, they'll say hello and then they won't tweet again other than that one hello for the entire chat. And then they'll message me after and they'll be like, this was a really insightful chat. You know, thanks so much for having it. And they like it's funny because like they they wanted to be there and they were there but they didn't share anything and connect and i think that um like it's okay to have an opinion it's okay to connect with people and even if what you say um doesn't uh don't be afraid of saying something stupid and then you know getting corrected and, and learning something new like it happens all the time you know the basically fail up <laughs> Yes, that like that channel fell up. Who who are some people that you follow on social media? Oh, I follow so many people on social media. Um, I follow. Oh, I feel so put on the spot with this. I I follow basically everybody. I if you're on social media, I probably follow you. A great political answer. <laughs> if I don't follow you, let me know and I will. <laughs> great answer. Um, can you, so can you talk more about how uh? how um you, you're building your influencer list how people can like nominate themselves or get nominated yeah. how the process works yeah so the nomination form is on my website there's again a self-nomination form and an other nomination form a peer nomination form um it doesn't matter what you do this the, there's there's no difference on on the the form in terms of the impact that uh, your impact of getting on the list um the only difference is that the self-nomination form asks some more demographic questions to help us understand the breakout of the list a little bit more um and will uh anthony and i are going to be partnering to um launch the list uh, soon um the nomination forms open all year round so come come on down to my website at socialmccall.com, complete a nomination form, and on the next update, if you meet the, the minimal, bare minimum criteria, you'll be on the list. So, so let's say I nominate someone, how good should I know the person? Me and the person like best buddy, so I just know them professional level in general, or so I just know the information on your form? Yeah, it's, it doesn't matter. Um, I do require an email because we need to notify people who are on the list that they were on the list. Um, so I do require an email, but other than that, you don't have to know the person. They could literally, if you follow somebody's blog and you're like, oh my God, this is an amazing person. They should be on the list. Nominate them. So talk about blogs. I mean, this is my opinion. Like back in the day, blogs were a big deal. People blogged all the time. It's like blogs are kind of dying off. Am I wrong with this or, or are blogs still a big deal? Um, I don't, that is a good question. I, to be honest, I used to read a lot of blogs and now I don't, but I, yeah, I like to think- a while. <laughs> I like to think it's because I don't have a lot of time and not because I hate blogs. <laughs> um, but I do think that podcasts like yours are becoming way more prevalent than blogs. So back to social media. So if someone's a marketer, HR, business board, the case may be, they have no social media, no presence. What would you advise them to do to get started? Like to this, what should they, what should they do? Well, I would advise you to log uh, to, you know, go to twitter.com and click uh, sign up and create a registration and um, then follow a bunch of people that sound interesting to you. And if somebody that you followed, you know, doesn't interest you anymore, unfollow them and, um, you know, start talking to people. So you remind me of something I forgot to ask you. Can you talk about Twitter lists? Are those any good? Yeah. Those outdated? I mean, I'm, I'm on like at least 30 Twitter lists that I never look at anymore. Like, or were they even a thing before? What's the benefit of them? You know what? I really never considered them at all until I made the list. And somebody's like, you should make a Twitter list out of the actual list. And then so we can all connect easier. And to be honest, I haven't really seen any benefits of it at all. And I totally forgot that I even did that. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if there's any value. Maybe there is. Uh, Maybe there is. By accident, I had I made a Twitter list about a year ago about people I wanted to interview, and I accidentally found it like 
a day ago, right? Like, oh, I forgot this. I even made this list, right? <laughs> it doesn't seem like you found any <laughs> value in doing it either. No. Um, can you tell us uh, your, your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah. So fine. I'm social McColl on everything. And uh, for our listeners, we're going to have the, uh, her links to her website, her social media on the show notes. You can find our show notes at www.kevinshlblog.com. Nicole, we're kind of at the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom, anything you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, I think my biggest piece of advice right now is just be human. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Everybody's stressed. Everybody's tired. Everybody hasn't seen their friends in a while. So be safe, stay at home, wear a mask, and be empathetic and human. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the show. This was fun. And to our guests, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.